gather together and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we do have a few announcements this morning. Uh, today is Peace with Justice Sunday, so there are some special envelopes available if you are able to, to give to this special offering um, over and above your, your regular giving. Um, or if you don't have the envelope, you miss it, and you, if you want to write a check, you can just memo that to PWJS, Peace with Justice Sunday. Um, so we, this is a global uh, effort of our denomination, and so people all over the United Methodist Church are participating in this. I think we have a video. Because <laughs> they sort of look at me like... <laughs> we got it. Part of the offering stays in our annual conference to do those kinds of social justice ministries here, and part of the um, money raised goes to uh, the denomination to do those kinds of ministries all over the world. So, um, as you're able, we, we hope that you will participate. Uh, you can see that uh, through the course of the rest of the week, the Zoom book study continues. Uh, they're reading the book White Fragility. Um, if you're interested in that, you can see more information from Life of Benedetto. Our uh, preschool summer camp starts this week, so that's exciting news that we will have little voices in the basement again. Um, Saturday is morning gardening, um, so if you're able to join with the folks to do some weeding and trimming, and I honestly don't know what they're doing this month, so, um, uh, so if you're able to, to be here on Saturday at 9, um, bring along with some gardening tools, and um, Heidi will, will give you some direction when you get here. So. Um, next Sunday, um, I will not be with you for worship. Uh, Reverend Darnitha Murphy will be preaching next week, and then Pastor Kathleen will be preaching the Sunday after that as I go on vacation for, for a little bit here. Um, uh, Reverend Scott McClellan is on call for me, so if you need to reach him for some reason, um, Takesha in the office has that information, as well as Carol Dunn and John Vogel, so please reach out to them. Um, just a reminder that in the hallway outside the office is where Takesha generally hangs anything she doesn't know where else to hang. Because um, there's cork strips there, friends. Uh, so if you don't find yourself down that hallway very often, you might every once in a while just want to wander down there um, to see you know, what community events are happening or the conference newspapers are hanging in that hallway if you want to see what's going on there as well. So uh, check that out. Um, this last week, uh, Three of us were at annual conference. Uh, Robin for her first time, and Carol Dunn showed her the ropes. Um, so we were there and uh, able to uh, pick up our 100% conference apportionment payment in 2021. So thank you and congratulations to all of you for knowing that that's important. And then we got our certificate for being a Mission Lakes Church. Um, if you've been around a while, this program used to be called the Rainbow Covenant, uh, but it's now Mission Lakes. Okay, kind of almost like happy now. Uh, so you can't be a Mission Lakes Church unless you pay all your apportionments first. So this is the first mile of giving, and then this is the second mile of giving into um, some specific missional areas. And so, so thank you, congregation, for making this a priority, for living out uh, your love for missions in so many ways. The other thing that happened at annual conference is the bishop fixed appointments. And I will be here for another year, friends. So, some of you might be thinking we're stuck with her, but but it is good to it's good to be together and it's good to know what's happening and what's coming and and. 
there was no, like, I, I, I'd not been approached, none of those things, but it's just nice when it's official, right? Like, when the bishop fixes appointments, that's always a, a good um, a good thing in our lives. I didn't even look who was supposed to be my living target. Will, will you then help lead us in worship? Because I think I'm done with all the announcements.
Holy and gracious God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you that you are with us when things irritate us in this world. Because there's some stuff. Thank you that we don't have to go it alone. That just like the oyster has goo that makes things better, we, we have something even better than that. We have you. We have your love. And you share that with us and call us to share it with the world. Lord, when we fail in that, help us to ask for forgiveness, knowing that you give when we ask, and we pray that we can restore relationships in that afternoon. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ.
The second General Conference of the United Methodist Church that I attended was in 2008. And I've been to every one of them since then, working in some shape or fashion. But, in, but that particular night of opening, our opening session, our opening worship, 6,500 people from all over the world gathered for worship that day in 2008. Together, all of us took communion, sharing in the body of Christ together from wherever we were from. And then together, we heard Bishop Janice Riggle Huey, at the time the outgoing president of the Council of Bishops and the Bishop of the Houston area, which is the Texas Annual Conference, and now retired, preach about a future with hope, which was the theme of that whole general conference. Her words have stuck with me so much that I have shared at least parts of her sermon in every appointment I've had, because this just has stayed with me and lived with me. Um, she gives a visual description for, for what hope looks like in our world that I didn't know I needed, but it resonates. It, it makes you just understand what she's talking about. So she preached. First century Christians were known by how much they loved one another. I believe that 21st century Christians will be known by the power of their hope that God will indeed <coughs> redeem the world. Hope is the nerve center of the Christian life. Love is the heart, faith the muscle. It's impossible to live without hope. Show me someone who is without hope, Christian, Jew, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, you name it, and I will show you someone who is either dead or so in despair that they are capable of the most awful violence. The Bible itself, she says, beginning to end is the story of hope. The book of Genesis tells us about a dove flying back to the ark with a sprig of hope in her beak. Abraham and Sarah met hope disguised as three strangers. Isaiah caught a glimpse of hope as a lion and a lamb laying down together, as water flowing in the desert, as a valley lifted up, as a shoot just coming forth from a long forgotten stone. The prophet Jeremiah tells a bunch of beaten down refugees to pick themselves up, build houses, plant gardens, and birth children because God has plans for them. A future with hope. <clears throat> Jesus preached the good news of a realm where hope reigns supreme. A kingdom of peace, a kingdom of justice, a kingdom of mercy, a world where people forgive one another, not once, but 70 times, seven times. A world where the blind see and the sick are cured. A world where leaders stoop down and wash their, wash their followers' dirty feet. Jesus taught his disciples a prayer of hope, and we say it every day. We've already said it in worship today, although she said we will say it again tonight because she was preaching in the evening. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In writing this letter to the church at Rome, the Apostle Paul paints on this cosmic canvas of salvation history, the focal point of the painting being the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Resurrection hope, she says, transforms lives. Resurrection lives then transform the world. Unfortunately, at least in the English language, the word hope seems to have gotten a little out of shape lately. Hope has gotten, how shall we say, a little flabby, like muscles without enough exercise. Now remember, she's a bishop. Preaching to the global denomination here, okay? So put that picture back in your mind. You've probably overheard a conversation like this. I know you wouldn't say it. Hey, may I count on you to serve supper at the homeless shelter next Thursday? Um, I hope so. Pastor, we're going to start a new church in your area. Will you help us? Um, uh, I, I hope so. We've got a vision creating a thousand volunteering mission teams of young adults to work in 30 countries around the world to reduce poverty. It's going to take 
take people, places, training, money. Will you, will you help us make it happen? Um, I hope, hope so. Could, could you get back to me on that? Can we, can we chat later? Do you hear what's happening here, she asks. Do you hear, hear what's happening here? The word hope is becoming a marshmallow word. It sounds soft. It looks sweet and appealing, but get it close to the fire and the hope melts off the stick and drips to the ground. John Wesley would say that marshmallow hope is the hope of almost Christians. In my travels to churches in Texas and Arkansas, the two places where she'd been a bishop at that point, and I've been to lots of them, she said, I often ask the folk gathered there, friends, Tell me about your mission. I confess to you with no small amount of sadness that I can no longer count the number of times that I've heard this response. Mission? Bishop, we just hope to survive, to survive another year. And we don't know how we're going to do that. Do you understand what I mean? The Apostle Paul said that hope that is, not, that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. It's in this hope that we are saved. The Apostle Paul uses hope five times in those two sentences. And when he does so, he's not describing some sweet, sappy kind of hope that melts in the noonday sun. He's not describing good intentions or wishful thinking. He is describing the sure confidence the sure confidence of a future reality. In fact, Paul says that this kind of hope is like a woman giving birth to a child. There's struggle, there's pain, there's suffering, there's brokenness, but new birth is going to happen. That baby is going to come. Yes, disciples wait, but their waiting is not static. Their waiting is not static or passive. Rather, disciples wait with eager longing unfettered imaginations to discover where God is already at work in the world and to join with God in that transformation. Dr. Eugene Peterson says it this way, the resurrection life that you receive, receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It is adventurous, expected, freeing God with a child like, what's next, Papa? with words, doesn't she? Now the scripture lesson that she is referencing from Paul is just a little farther ahead in the book of Romans than where we read today. But today's passage points at similar thoughts about hope. But what Bishop Huey had to say about the diminishing of the word hope in our world is so very true even still today, all these years later. We don't think about the fact that as Christians, our hope is on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. So when we hope, we hope in Jesus. And Jesus is a sure thing. So hope for us doesn't have to be wishy-washy. Now, friends, there is plenty in this world that tries to convince us that hope, that we shouldn't hope in a thing, that this marshmallow idea of hope is in fact true. I mean, we see the agony of the world around us, so many people being told they can't take care of their own medical procedures. People having the color of their skin thrown at them as if it is something to be ashamed of. People whose gender or sexual orientation has made them targets of cruelty from people who don't even make an attempt to understand a life different from their own. People who, who don't care what we're doing to the planet, even if there are simple ways that we can slow the destruction of this very gift from God. There are plenty of reasons our hope should melt into that fire, off that stick, and just into the ash. But Margaret Amer reminds us in these particular verses, Paul challenges the church to behave differently. She writes, rather than hiding itself in the face of oppression, the Roman church, Paul argues, is to stand and to boast. It is to boast in its hopes 
and to boast in its afflictions, to boast in its hopes is to affirm again the glory of God upon which the church stands, the glory of the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead and who through the power of the Holy Spirit has poured love into the church. Such boasting makes sense for it speaks to the honor bestowed upon the church by the God of heaven and earth. Surely, surely one could not garner more honor than to be vindicated by one's faithfulness to the God of the cosmos. In the face of such honor, Paul can assert like Isaiah before him, do not fear for you will not be ashamed. Do not be discouraged for you will not suffer disgrace. This, this is the hope that we have in our Trinitarian God. It, it gives us a place to stand, a foundation even when we struggle. Right? This is the foundation on which we build our whole lives. It's not, in fact, a marshmallow that will melt at the first sign of heat. Richard Sheffield tells a story about a time when he was going through some struggles and a friend said to him, don't waste the pain. We will encounter pain. We will encounter struggles in our lives. We, we will feel rejection and abandonment from wherever it comes. We will look around our world and wonder just what the heck is going on out there. Don't tell me you've watched the news and not thought that. But Sheffield reminds us that Paul's life had not been easy either. He had suffered much and would again before his death a few years later in Rome. His formula for hope describes what he learned from his pain. Not, not that suffering is desirable or to be pursued or, or to be wished on anyone else, right? But that when pain comes, and it will, denial and avoidance are the waste. Life and health, hope even, can come even in the midst of suffering out of our learning to endure and growing in character that will give us hope. God, God in community, as the Trinity, like that's how we know God, God is community, hold us as we walk through the suffering, the endurance, the character, and the hope. We don't have to walk through those things alone. We don't have to figure them out by ourselves because we too have been given a community in which to experience and share all of life. May the strength that we find in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit allow us to boast in our sufferings so that we might know the true hope in Jesus Christ. Amen.
their yellow cards that need to make their way to the front this morning. Um, at the first service this morning, uh, Lita Sadoff asked us to be in prayer for her mom, Barb. Um, she's been sick with a bad cold for a while now and then now has been exposed to COVID while her immune system was down. So, so prayers for Barb. Uh, Sally Rogers asks us to pay, pray for Gloria and Mike Grayless um, and their family as their son Mike passed away last week. So prayers for them. I did much better in the last name of the service, didn't I, Shelby? Um, Lisa Shannon asks us to be in prayer for her grandson. His second birthday is on June 19th. So two's a big one. Um, Elvira Morgan asks us uh, to lift prayers for her brother and his wife, Karen, who have COVID in California, um, and also for my son-in-law's brother, uh, who is in hospice with cancer. So prayers for, for them. And then, um, the last one, you have a friend who has told on you, Alvera, they celebrate your birthday on June 10th. Mm. It's a big one. So those are the joys and concerns this morning. Um, I invite us into a time of silent prayer, and then I will lead us in a pastoral prayer. Let us pray. God of the universe, you have called us from different walks of life, and from our diverse, diverse backgrounds, you have weaved us into a family of faith and discipleship. We pray that even as you have accepted us as we are, we can learn even more how to accept and love others whose ways are different from our own. As we open our hearts to you, show us the way to open our hearts to others. We pray, O oh God, that you would even challenge us to love all humankind, those we do not like, in addition to those we do, and Lord, especially our enemies. In your presence here, O oh God, may we worship together without exclusion and rejoice together always. So many in our world need to know that you love them and accept them just as they are. Help us to not grow weary in doing that work. Help us not to excuse pain and suffering in our world but also not turn away from it. We pray that you would redeem everything we experience so that your glory is known beyond our lives. We lift up to you those names we have shared here in worship today, as well as the names of those whose life situations are still too tender to share. You know who needs to know love, peace, acceptance, that they are not alone, that there is hope in our world, and that all of these things come from your love that we know in Jesus Christ. Empower us through the Holy Spirit to serve those who need you today and always. Help us to also not lose sight of the good that is happening in our world. Show us ways to continue to celebrate and offer the good that you are so that our world would turn away from violence and hatred and toward peace and love. We pray these things in the name of our communal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, then, I invite our ushers forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings, our generous response to a God who has been abundantly generous with us.
God who loves us in a myriad of ways, we are thankful for all you have blessed us with. We humbly ask you to bless and multiply what we share with you today in whatever form we have shared it, so that your hope is known and understood. In this sharing with each other, may we together stand on the solid rock that is your hope. In Christ's name we pray. Okay, so let's try that. Let's see. 